our discussion on two topics today. The first is motivating students and the second one is interactive teaching methods. As she said, I don't claim any formal expertise in any one of these, but I will try to share with you my own experiences and then uh, you can make whatever you, you can out of those experiences. I will try and tell you many stories. I specialize in storytelling. But most of those stories are first hand. As you can see, I have no slides. I have cock sheets which I have prepared for last one month. It was interesting to note that one month's effort came out to just three pages of scribbled notes. So, my first act is to say back to basics. So when we talk about motivating students, when we talk about doing anything in fact, as an information scientist, I typically like to ask these questions. What are we trying to do? Who are we trying to address things to? Why we are trying to do what we are trying to do? Where we would like to do what we want to do? And when we would do that? The first job is to find answers to these five values and then of course finally once we are satisfied that we understand these we need to answer how do we do this. In a medieval style this is described as five wives and one husband. But I think these, these are important questions. So what are we trying to do? motivate. Anybody could help me with what motivation would mean generally? What would to motivate mean? Okay. Create interest. Create interest. Ensure no demotivation. That's a very, uh, I would say negative positive statement. <laughs> but it's a circular definition, so we will not uh, take that. You, you cannot use the word itself to define itself. So, no. Okay, to create positive thoughts. All of these statements presume that unless we do something about it, these things will not happen. That means there is a need to motivate. If that need is not fulfilled, people would largely remain unmotivated. Is that assumption correct? I would submit that as human beings, each one of us are naturally motivated for doing certain things. The first and foremost is survival. The survival instinct guides the entire human species to do so many things which the other species don't do. Can we not therefore assume that some fundamental motivation can be taken for granted in every human being that we deal with? Therefore, when we say we want to motivate, we must mean something more than that. So what is that something more? So when we say to encourage students to do hard work, we are saying we want to encourage students to do harder work than what they would otherwise do. When we say we want to increase positive thinking, we are not assuming for a moment that all human beings think negatively. We are assuming that they would ordinarily be thinking positively. But we want to increase that positive thinking. And as he rightly points out, in that context, uh, stopping them from getting demotivated would mean reducing the negative thinking that you might occasionally observe amongst your students. In general, there are logical faculties and emotional faculties and both work in harmony in human beings to permit them to achieve whatever creative uh, pursuits they do. The logical faculty 
is often defined by two factors. One is a genetic factor and as God's children, the human species have been endowed with very special logical thinking capabilities which other species do not have to the same extent. The emotional factor, however, is a variable. It varies depending upon so many things. We are all familiar with that. Our moods, for example, depending upon whether I had a fight yesterday evening with my family or whether I had a very nice cozy dinner, my behavior today morning would be affected sometimes greatly. Barring these ups and downs which will happen on a day-to-day, instant-to-instant basis, our objective therefore would be to keep the positive energy levels at the highest position. That should be perhaps one of the expectations out of motivation. I would therefore like to define to motivate should mean to me is to increase emotional involvement in whatever students are doing. So basically increase energy levels, increase passion. We of course understand that this increase is expected to be in the positive direction that is constructive and not destructive. Because as you know, human energies are capable of doing both very well. We have seen those, we see them again and again. So amongst all the definitions that are available, for example, Oxford Dictionary is a slightly different definition of motivation. A person who is motivated is, is said to be one who works harder and with greater interest. That is something that came out of our earlier discussion works harder and works with greater interest. So the relative term is important. The relative term is also important in absolute sense to every student. If we have 60 students in a class or 100 or 20 or whatever be the number, in fact number is one of the problems as I shall mention later on. But we must understand that each individual student is an individual package of logical thinking capabilities and emotional energies. No two human beings are alike. Okay. And we as teachers somehow must address every individual student. That is very hard actually. The hardest part is to be able to address every individual student. But somehow that must be the motive behind whatever we do. So what we want to do then is to motivate, which for the purpose of our discussion, we will take it to mean to increase the emotional involvement. You would all agree that the emotional involvement is more, if the energy levels are more, if the passion is greater, then the same logical thinking capabilities get applied more vigorously to whatever activity students or for that matter any human being is doing. Whom do we want to motivate? So we now ask, now answer the second question, who? Students is of course our understand. But let's examine this in slightly greater detail. Who are these students? In an institution where we all teach, we can categorize students into various classes. What we automatically mean by students is students in our class that we are teaching. But is that definition comprehensive enough? There are students who are not sitting in my class, but there are students in my institution. There are teachers in my institution who are going to teach and motivate other students and they would also like to learn. Should we therefore not expand the notion of a student to the notion of all learners? Why do we specifically target those students who sit in our classes and take our courses, we cannot say that other learners are not part and parcel of the educational process that we engage ourselves in, which means it, this will include not only other students whom I don't teach, not only other teachers who, don't, who are not students at all, 
but more fundamentally it includes myself as a teacher i will dwell upon this later but i am convinced that unless i can motivate myself my ability to motivate others would be very limited and therefore i must spend enough time in motivating myself and remain motivated why why do we want to motivate people why do we want to motivate students various definitions of course after all when we want them to work harder when we want them to be more interested ultimately what is the object we want them to do better in life we want them to be better problem solvers we want them to develop new technologies we want them to be more effective we want them to be more productive so can we say to make more productive and effective in whatever they do when are people more productive and more effective one is of course when they are motivated the second and equally important part is when they are enjoying things that they are doing so i would like to add with your permission to make them more productive and effective in a happy manner i am using a very generic word but i hope you will understand anybody who is unhappy will be less productive and less effective than what he or she can be and that brings us to the second important corollary of this the objective must be because as i said each human being is distinct and different the logical faculty is there would be some differences while god has endowed us with great faculties there will be some differences the ability to work hard the ability to concentrate the ability to engage would be different in in different people are we therefore trying to bring every human being to the same level of achievement well i personally believe that is not possible after all all of you have been teachers so when you evaluate students there is somebody who is at top of and there is somebody who is at the bottom of the class and just because somebody is at the top does not mean that that person knows everything in that subject similarly just because somebody is at the bottom of the class does not mean either that the student does not know anything about this so the objective why we want to do this could also be stated as getting the best out of an individual i must warn you that this is a condition which can never be evaluated to be satisfied why because no human being has figured out what is the best that that human being can do every time you do something if you examine you can always feel that you could have done something better and you do that better and after that you again you go back and introspect you find no could have done something better if this is true with each one of us there is no reason to believe why it is not true with each one of our students and therefore this is what we call an illusive target a perpetual target if we remember that the students will be with us for a very limited period of their younger years four years for a undergraduate school two years for a postgraduate school maybe four to five years for a phd school but rest of their lives they are going to spend independent just as they come to us with a certain makeup of their intellectual and emotional capabilities when they leave us they will acquire a whole lot of new inputs from the real world where they will work which will subsequently shape both their logical faculties and their emotional energies knowing this for us the objective must be preparing a student to continuously get the best out of himself or herself in the rest of the life which puts a very special responsibility on us 
a motivated student must never ever be demotivated irrespective of what life he or she faces. Like it or not, that is our responsibility. If we think motivating students is our responsibility, then the motivation cannot be short-lived. The motivation cannot end after they pass their degrees from our colleges and leave. To impart sustainable motivation then becomes an objective. You would agree that this is very important because we are preparing students for a long technical career. And in that entire career, their energy levels must be maintained at the highest level. When we recruit faculty members, this is a question that we often ask. When we promote faculty members or do not promote them, this is a question that we often ask. A young assistant professor coming to the institute or a lecturer coming to another college might appear to be very enthusiastic, might indeed be very motivated at that point in time. Will that person be able to retain that motivation level 20 years hence, particularly if during those 20 years the person does not get any advancement in the career, any recognition, any improvement in the salary structure? You can all see that. In spite of all that, several of us remain motivated. If we go back and examine, perhaps there are some triggers in this self-motivation that we receive in our own school days, in our own college days, from some teachers. Teachers are not just those who are branded as teachers. Even our parents are our first teachers. Our colleagues are our teachers. People in life are teachers. Perhaps those learnings that we picked up at various places permit us to retain the higher levels of energy, higher levels of motivation later. If we agree with this, then is it therefore not our duty to impart that kind of motivation to our students which will be sustained, which cannot be challenged and changed by the rest of the world, no matter what the world does to them. Of course, we would expect the world to do good things to them because we believe the students who come to us are good students in the first place. So this is my answer to why we want to motivate. We want to create people who are maximally productive and effective in lives, who are happily being productive and effective, not unhappily. And we want to create people who remain motivated throughout their lives after their lives, no matter what they are, where they are, what they do. As to when and how, sorry, where and when, to where, my answer is everywhere. So what does it mean? We ordinarily engage people in classrooms. That is fine. Do we engage them or not, even at least by chance, at places other than classrooms? Well, I must include laboratories, of course. They are part and parcel of the academic activities. But those of you who have hostels on the campus would have had the privilege of interacting with students occasionally during their hostel stay as wardens or something. Those of you who do not have hostels would have occasion to have interacted with them on several events, whether it is social gathering, whether it is a technical event of the institution, whether it is simply a inter-college a drama competition where you just go to attend that competition and see how your students are performing. Whether you meet them in market. Anywhere, everywhere. Why I stress this is that if we presume that we have some ability to motivate students, then this ability cannot be and should not be switched on and switched off depending upon where we are. The ability must it make itself felt and seen by the students independent of where they interact with us. This is very important because students who are otherwise motivated by a teacher in a classroom 
by observing a shoddy behavior of the same teacher somewhere else might completely get demotivated. Believe me, I have seen this happening. And therefore, our responsibility is far greater. So therefore, it has to be everywhere. When? Again, I would say, everywhere. And what do we mean by everywhere? Because everywhere generally covers all the winds. But it covers only one part of the web. That is when we meet them and interact with them. So whether it is in the classroom, this, that, that. So that one is answered. But there is another hidden one. Even in absentia. This factor is important, particularly if you agree with my earlier observation that we must provide sustainable motivation. A sustainable motivation means that even 10 years later, 5 years later, the student remains motivated by whatever little we do, plus of course whatever so many other inputs that the student gathers in life. This sustainability means that in absentia motivation must be provided. Some acts of others, some thought processes, some interaction must imprint itself into the minds of students, that the students are forced to remember those even 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later. I cannot give a better example of, of this than some of the motivation that is provided by some very great leaders in a very short stint where the motivation is sustainable. All of us know Mahatma Gandhi, perhaps many of, know, many of us know the Champayan Satyagraha which he had launched. Uh, you will also remember late uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad was the first president of India. Not many may know that he was actually a practicing barrister, lawyer, an extremely well-to-do, wealthy individual. People used to pay him a lot of money because he was a very, very competent lawyer. All that the Mahatma did was at the initiation of the Champaran Satyagraha, he went and stayed with Rajendra Prasad because he was also an active congressman. He stayed with him for three days. That's all. And then he went about for his satyagraha and then he went about. Those three days are reported to have changed Dr. Rajendra Prasad's life. He gave up everything that he had. I don't know whether it is well known that when he died, he had nothing of his own. He had given up everything that he had. None of us, of course, are Mahatma Gandhi. And not many of our students would be the same as the capability of Dr. Rajendra Prasad. But we are still all human beings. We come from the same generation. But if you want to imagine what should be the sustainable motivation, I think this could be a good example of sustainable motivation. And therefore, I submit that our motivational effort must be everywhere, even when we are not present. For otherwise, they would be very limited. Would you agree with this analysis in general? Of course, there are many more dimensions to motivation. I am merely reciting some from my own personal experiences. You may add several rich experiences of your own to this. But please remember that I personally consider motivating students to be the most important contribution that teachers can make. Not even the actual technology teaching that we do would be comparable to this. So with this now, we'll come back to the question of how. Since motivating people is more of an emotional exercise than the logical exercise, it's extremely difficult to pin it down. And therefore, I would try to analyze again this from basics. So when we say how to motivate, first we understand what motivates a student. And here, to be very clear, I will generalize this to say what motivates a learner. Any ideas on this? I think all of us will agree that the fundamental motivation for the student comes in achieving better marks, grades, degrees. That's the fundamental motivation. 
We see that very often. In any quiz or any assignment that you give, people try to score maximum marks. They come and argue with us if they get less marks. They particularly come and argue with us if they get less marks than somebody else. That's a very standard phenomenon in IIT at least. Uh, this is called cribbing. And uh, the great cribboos will fight for half an hour for half a mark. Had they used that half an hour to study more, they would have got two marks in the next exam. But the spirit of fighting for that half mark is so predominant that they will argue endlessly. We see that. You would have seen that, right, in your own college. So marks, grades, degrees is a very very fundamental motivation fact. Unfortunately, this often becomes the most dominant motivating factor, if not the only motivating factor. And our acts do not sadly do much to dispel this myth. Our system of education has become such that the only evaluation that the student undergoes is measured in terms of marks and grades. Please remember that the students come to the engineering college having gone through precisely this setup all their 11 years of education, 12 years of education. All the time, the only evaluation has been marks, marks, marks. This results in a very sad situation which while we are cursorily aware of, we rarely have time to delve more deeply into it. It is important to understand that when you compare people based on their marks, then they obviously marks would have a pyramidal structure, there will be a large number of people at less marks, a few people at more marks, some people at some higher marks, one or two at the top. This is exactly how all students have been gauged or measured for 11 years of their life. In fact, you will appreciate that when students seek admission to engineering colleges, the only criteria that is applied for admission to a specific college or to a specific branch is the marks that they have scored in one exam, whether it is 12th standard exam or, or our joint entrance exam or your pre-engineering test or whatever it is. And that examination and its results classify students okay, very, very mercilessly into achievers and non-achievers. So depending upon the craze at the time of admission and the given point in time, today I believe it is computer science and IT. At one time it used to be mechanical engineering. When chemical engineering was a very specialized thing, there would be people who go in for chemical engineering as the top choice. The top choice is determined by various factors at different points in time. But at any given point in time, the factor which is the most determining, determining factor for this is the one which every student in the community will crave for. So if some student gets admission in VJTI for computer science, the student and the family will be scared. If on the other hand, let's say I have scored 77% marks, which is a very decent score in absolute terms, equivalent of an honors, but given the level of marks today, 77% is not even laughable. I'll probably not get admission anywhere. So I'll have to go to some small college in Jarsugula and take admission. And I will join that college or I will join the department which is not of my choice with a great level of diffidence in me. I will join that institution assuming that I am not good enough. And any evaluation based on marks will always create many more of such whom we call losers. They have not made it to what they wanted to make it to. So there are a few winners and many losers. We call this rat race, right? All of you would be familiar with this term, rat race at higher secondary level. Rat race has a beautiful property. Rat race always creates some winner rats, a few winner rats, and a large number of loser rats. Nevertheless, a rat race only creates rats. Our objective is to create human beings. One of the fundamental aspects that we must address is how do we take these incoming rats and convert them into humans.
I give an example which I found very pertinent. I myself learned from it when my colleague Professor Isaac uh, was teaching a course in uh, uh, computer programming. Those days we did not have 300 students class that started when the four year program started. Earlier it used to be different branches, you know, electrical, metallurgy, uh, chemical, I think were in one semester and civil, aeronautical, mechanical, or other semester, some such thing. So uh, I was actually teaching the course and he was my tutor. In those days we did not have enough masters teaching assistants. So teachers themselves used to be TAs. And uh, by the way, this is something very peculiar about IIT, but which I would like you to consider practicing at your places. I was a very young teacher then, but I was the instructor in charge for the course. Professor Isaac was my guru, my boss. He was my tutor. And in this arrangement, neither he nor I found anything different. He was given charge of a batch of students who were metallurgical engineering students. So during the tutorial time, as a teacher, I would go from class to class. And I just entered his class when I heard the following dialogue. So, uh, he was, of course, as usual, shouting at people, saying, why the hell are you not doing this? Why are you not able to do this problem? So one student got up, said, sir, we are only metallurgical engineering students. You know, computers and all are meant for electrical engineers. Those days, there's no computer science. So it's meant for electrical engineers. So obviously, they can solve these problems better. We can't solve them. He says, what is this nonsense? You know, you, you also learned a language. Electrical engineering students also learned a language. At the age of three years, which you call your mother tongue now. So why can't you learn this programming language, which is much stupider than a human language, why can't you learn it as well as they can? I thought this was a very simple example, but very effective example, which I have subsequently elaborated. And I always state this example, you might want to try this or a variation to tell your students this, that every human child learns a foreign language at the age of three years to four years, five years, whatever. And the child does not undergo any examination, any coaching, any classes, any certificates, any degree, books, nothing, nothing, absolutely not. And every human child learns that foreign language effectively in less than three years. Later on we call that foreign language the mother tongue of the child. My own conclusion is, that if a human child can do this complex problem solving, I consider it a very complex problem solving. Learning a foreign language, I don't know, some of you might have tried doing that now. Please see how the grown-ups learn a foreign language. I want to learn German, I will go attend an elementary course for one year, then I will take an intermediate course, then I will go to Max Muller Bhavan, I will take an advanced course, and after three years of rigorous course, books, lectures, certificates, exams, I will be able to barely translate some German literature from German into English. Can I speak German fluently? Doubtful. Can I understand everything that a German speaker speaks? Doubtful. And this, we have grown into our capabilities enormously. Then this happens. But when we are children, we can speak the mother tongue as fluently as any other human being of that particular species and sector can. No books, no exams, no certificates. What does it mean? I take it to mean that the God has endowed every individual human being with sufficient logical capability to solve most complex problems in life. Does it mean that all human beings are equal in their logical capabilities? Of course not. There are some who are quicker, who are faster. Please note that the modern learning teaching environment gives an enormous premium to those few who can think out the solution in the shortest possible time. Three hour exam, 10 minute quiz. Somebody who solves that problem in 12 minutes is useless. We get zero. Somebody has got 10 marks. 
and we do that people as useless. I have seen at the at the pre-engineering test level, I, I many this happened several years ago when IT was not there, but computer science was the was the top stream. And I go to a friend's place. His son had scored insufficient marks in the pre-engineering test or some such thing. But when I went home, the whole home was as if somebody has died in the family. You know. And I was, I was, I, I, I was talking to the friend. Hey, what happened? He says, "Are kai samnu tula phata? Ya porani satya naskela." The father is describing his own son's achievement in such derogatory terms. That means all the expectations of the family have gone kaput. It is greatly surprising that the young boy had not committed suicide already. Such are the pressures and expectations that the families now tend to put. And the students who survive those pressures still come to us to study mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, civil engineering, humanities, mathematics, physics, chemistry. But they come to us with a deep hurt, most of them. A few of them come with an extraordinary super confidence. I work computer science. I am the best in the world. God has sent me specially to this world, you know, to do something good for humanity. Other people are much higher. They don't, they don't matter. This is the mentality of the people that we get amongst our mates. What do we do about them? My suggestion, friends, is try and use this or similar examples that you can to tell them what is it that has made their life as is and what is it that can change it if they think the life is not already good enough. I have analyzed a child in this light, how a child learns this. I believe that the child has three extraordinary capabilities which somehow are diluted in the subsequent growth of the child. The first and foremost, curiosity. Have you ever seen a child who is not curious? I have not seen one. Extraordinarily curious about everything. Along with that curiosity, the child has extraordinary boldness to ask questions, including stupid questions. When a child asks some stupid questions, how do we react? Hare Baba, Sajalta. Why do we react differently when a student in our class asks a question which is apparently stupid? He says, sit down, don't disturb the class, don't ask stupid questions. Why? Please remember, and this is something I have learned first hand from an extraordinary teacher, Professor Bedford, who used to teach us electrical fields. And in our intake classes, one student, you know, who continuously asked questions which most of us felt were silly. But he would always react saying, you have a point. However, if you see it like this, and painstakingly he will explain again, second time, third time. And we used to be amazed as to how he can control his anger and frustration. Later on when I became a teacher, and I had an occasion to talk to him, I mentioned this point to him. Professor Bedford, how can you be so nice to such people? You know what he said? He says, Father, it has nothing to do about being nice. It is to do with retaining his boldness to ask questions. He says, please understand one thing. If you knew that the question he was asking is stupid, he is intelligent enough not to have asked it. So for him or her, the difficulty is real. And laughter will provide to the child. Very good point. Extremely important point. Thank you for making this suggestion. So my dear friends, our educational system chews up people's boldness from the time they enter the first standard in a class till the time they pass 12th standard. By the time they come to us, they have forgotten their boldness. And because they have stopped asking questions, they have stopped asking questions to themselves, 
which means they have forgotten their curiosity also. And as you would all know, whether it is engineering or any other field, learning is all about asking questions. Learning is all about applied mind. Learning is all about being curious. We have therefore a far greater challenge that the society has given us the responsibility to deal with. How do we take these 12th standard students, most of whom have lost their curiosity and boldness? And I'll come to the other category of few winners in a short while. I submit that even they have lost this for a different reason altogether. And how do we resurrect that? There is a third capability, and that is perseverance. I have rarely seen a child who gives up on something that it wants to do. It will try two times, three times, five times, ten times. It will not give up. If a child wants to come and stand on this desk, then child will pull from that end, pull from that end, fall down twice, pull the chair, stand on the chair, again fall, cry for two minutes. Finally, eighth attempt, tenth attempt, somewhere, when others are not looking, the child would have managed to pull a, a stool or something, stand up on it, get on top of it. And then when you notice the child is smiling happily. When did we last smile so happily in our lives? I am not even talking about students, I am talking about us. We human beings as we grow up seem to lose out on perseverance. We learn to give up. In our school, we attempt some difficult problems sometimes, then we give up after some times. By the time we finish the school, we have graduated to a level where we have learned to give up without even trying once. My humble submission to you friends is that if you can resurrect the curiosity, the boldness and the perseverance of a child in your students, you have won 90% of the battle. Rest of it, the students will do themselves. And I am very thankful to the suggestion that was made here that this perhaps happens because of the environment of trust and love. I would not say that the environment of trust and love creates these qualities. I would still maintain that these are the qualities that the God has been kind enough to give to us. Some of these are intrinsic in every life form, but human species specially have this right from birth. We do the sinful activity of curtailing these things through our system. But can we not therefore do a positive activity of resurrecting these to the extent that is possible? All that it needs to be done is that the students must be told, no matter what marks you got, no matter whether you got admission in the college of your choice or not, no matter you got admission to your field of your choice or not, after all, your choices were based on certain assumptions at that point in time. Four years later, when you pass out of my institute, you are going to face a world which may be much different than what it was when, when you thought about doing this. And don't forget that every activity in human sphere requires as much innovation, as much hard work, as much problem solving, as much enjoyment as any other field. There is nothing so peculiar about Java programming that is not there in, in, let's say, designing a better heat engine. In fact, many claim, and perhaps correctly, that Java programming is rather stupid activity. It's a very mechanical activity after some time. The amount of innovation that you can do is so limited there. Given this fact, do we use this or similar example to tell students, don't at all be worried, but whatever the system has done to you. You are now entering a phase where you will face a system which is not defined by syllabus and exams. You can emphasize that when they go out in real life, there is not a single real problem which they will face which is as per some syllabus. Real life problems are not defined by syllabi. Syllabi are defined from our knowledge of real life problems as the knowledge grows. I would therefore think that motivating students by taking them out of the ambit of just marks, grades and degrees is an important task. Unfortunately, our engineering education system does not even attempt to do this. It unfortunately attempts to consolidate 
a similar behavior for four more years on students. Yearly examination, we have semesterly examination, you have half semester examination, you have weekly tests, you have weekly quizzes. It is called continuous evaluation. I have no problems with evaluation. But continuous evaluation in terms of marks, reinforcing the students' misconceived notion that marks are everything in life and we happily help enhance this notion. Can we do something about it? Well, I don't know. You are the ones who run the systems within yourselves. And there are some mechanisms that I would suggest where, where something can be done in spite of the system, not because of the system. You might also want to tell them, coming back to what, what motivates the students. So Marx, grades and degrees have spent, I think, entirely too much time on this aspect. But I believe that this is the crux of any demotivation that we see among students. And to counter that is not to say marks don't mean anything, that will be nonsense. Not to say degrees or subjects don't mean anything, that will be nonsense. But what is correct to say is that why the marks are important? They are not everything in life and they are certainly not the most important. And in the very first place you got more or less marks, perhaps because of these factors of curiosity, boldness, and perseverance. Take care of these, marks will come automatically. What motivates students also, like what motivates all other human beings, is ability to dominate and to control. You would see that in the student days, how fiercely the student body elections are fought. Who would be the class representative? Who would be the general secretary? In the school, well, who will be the monitor? Okay, what are these positions? Sadly, these are not considered to be positions where in the leadership role, those individuals facilitate others doing great things. But these are considered to be positions where you control things or dominate things. But this is a motivating factor in every human being's life. After all, in our own lives, consider this. What does it mean to become head of the department? I have seen heads of the departments who used to cherish signing casual applications. It was, it was such a sad thing to see that. Okay? Instead of considering oneself to be a great facilitator for greater academic activities, one considers oneself to be a controller of other human beings if it happens to us, do you believe there is any reason why it will not happen to students? And therefore, one of the activities that we can undertake is to inculcate in them the notion that what is greatly satisfied is not domination or control, but facilitation. And that they can enjoy these roles greatly while controlling things but facilitating things. All the team activities that you do, team projects, team assignments, they should all be seen in this perspective, team event organization. You know in IIT Bombay, the Mood Indigo and Tech Fest, these are great events. Not a single participation from any faculty member except for guidance and advice is taken. Everything is organized by students themselves. They learn how to organize. They learn the leadership emerges out of that. And even if your institutions are not residential institutions, encouraging people to organize events better is something that you can help them tremendously with in order to give the message that the leadership is for facilitating, not for controlling. Another press, this is a, a human factor that cannot be forgotten. So what motivates a student? Marks, grades, degrees, domination and control. There is a third element which should be, in my opinion, the most important element, but sadly, marks, grades and degrees overshadow everything else and therefore this element is often not seen or perceived. This element, in my opinion, is recognition, respect, honor. 
I think these are great emotional motivators to any human being. At the extreme, you can think of the soldiers, you know, who are willing to shoot at others and take bullets in their chest for the honor and glory of a piece of cloth which we call national flag. This, this behavior defies all logic. There is no logic, you know, in, in stupidly going and dying there or willing to die. I mean, we talk about jihadis are terrorists in, in bad sense. Of course, we talk about that in bad sense because they are doing destructive activities. But do not forget their motivational levels are no less than that of the Nobel laureates. I would like to submit that role models are extremely important for motivating a student. And I would additionally like to submit that after the parents in the younger days, teacher is the most important role model in the life of a student. We can see that, you know, when young, young children from kindergarten school of first, second, third standard, when they come home, and if you try to advise them something contrary to what the teacher has advised, they will never take it. this. What nonsense? The teacher has said this. You might be a big professor in IIT, you don't count. The teacher has said this. If the teacher says 2 plus 2 is 5, it is 5, no matter how logically you defend it. That's the value of us as role models. I would like to suggest to you from my own experiences as to how we can improve ourselves to become role models that will motivate the students maximally. You would agree that we are role models, whether we like it or not. No, that's the problem. Even if I am a very bad teacher, I am still a role model. My bad habits will be taken by that student to be the right things to do in life. I don't know how many of you have read Taittiriya uh, Upanishad when, uh, you know, like our convocation ceremony, there is a ceremony where the children in the ashram go, go back and, and, um, and a message is read out to them. Dharmam chara, satyam vada, you must have heard of these phrases. But there is a lot more to it. It tells the students to copy the behavior of the teachers, but it also tells them copy only that behavior which is good. And it actually tells them do not copy that behavior of your teachers which is bad. The reason Taittiri Upanishad authors felt like stating this is because they knew that human beings being fallible. There will be some of us who will not behave well, at least at some times. But the young students might even take that as a part of the role model exercise and imbibe that and therefore they need to be explicitly warned, do not do this. Follow me, but only in those things which are good. Do not follow me in those things which I do badly. This is the Indian wisdom of thousands of years ago. We do not emphasize this. But independent of whether we do or not, I would submit that for all of our students, we remain the role models. And therefore, what shall be our own behavior becomes extremely important. Because the major motivation comes from this. The teacher's entire behavior becomes a package for the student to adapt. Please remember the student will adapt only selectively. The student will only adapt what is most easy to adapt. But if we as teachers are rigorous in most of the things that we do, the student will have little choice but to adapt most of that rigor that the student sees in us. The first and the most fundamental, preparation and hard work. How much time do we spend in preparing for every class? Let me tell you from my own experience that our students, while they might pay some attention to how well we speak, okay, how greatly we conduct our classes or something, but they are intelligent and sensitive enough to understand whether we are well prepared or not for a class. And there is absolutely no justification for me as a teacher to go before my audience at any point in time without adequate preparation. I was fortunate to have learned this when I was a young teacher here. As I said, people like uh, Professor Jimmy Singh Isaac and H.B. Kekre were my gurus and my own colleagues. 
forced me to do this. I remember my first course in analog computers when I taught uh, with electrical engineering students. And one student sitting in the front bench, he used to wear chappals, no paper on site, he's not taking notes. And he would take out his chappal and keep waving his foot like this, you know. Sitting like this, doing this. Uh, very, uh, what should I say, uh, an activity which will cheese you off, you know. Why the hell is he not taking notes? Why the hell is he not reading? Those days, there used to be blackboard, you know, one, two, three sections. Most of you would be familiar. And I had started writing some equations on the first board, then second board, third board. Came back to the first side, removed everything that was there, wrote something else. And then the second plan, again removed everything and wrote something else. And suddenly, I, I got non plus because there was some equation which was not matching on either side. Some sign somewhere. And I started looking back and I, I asked students, why is this not equation balancing? And the students also were looking everywhere. And then this student suddenly says, sir, there is a sign mistake. So I said, yes, I know that, but where it is, I can't find it. No, sir, it is on the first board which you rubbed off some time ago. There is no paper in his front, but he is reciting from memory. He is, of course, the person who won the issue of gold medal uh, one and a half years later. But such is the perception of the students, their ability. I went back and I went to my guru, Professor Kekre, and I said, that, why did I have to face this nonsense? I mean, I studied well, I had spent five hours working for this work. So, which books did you read? So, I told him, these are the two books. What? You went to a class reading only two books? So, I, what do you mean they are prescribed textbooks? What nonsense? Then he narrated a list of seven books. Uh, Jackson and this and that. And he says, go to the library, get all these books. And uh, when is your next class? Monday. So you have weekend there. Good. You got two days and two nights. Read all of them. And that is hard work. That is very, very hard work. How do you improve your delivery? How do you control whether you can actually be effective in, in teaching whatever you do? I had done this experiment. It was a very costly experiment. My wife was very unhappy at that time. I bought a tape recorder, a Sony's tape recorder. It used to cost 750 rupees those days. My salary was 425. And it was a very costly thing, particularly when my wife found out that it's not meant to listen to music, but to do some stupid things. Uh, the stupid thing I used to do is I would prepare my lecture. Those days we did not have this transparency or something, so it was a blackboard. I would prepare that lecture and I would stand in front of a mirror and give that lecture for one hour, timing myself. And then I would listen to that lecture. What appeared to me to be a flawless lecture, when I listened to it, I will again start seeing, ah, ooh, eh, interruptions, uh, something wrong. So again, correct it, again try it. It was hard work. But believe me, it helped me improve tremendously in a very short possible. It helped me improve tremendously. There is no substitute for hard work. And what I am suggesting in the context of motivating students is that our students are intelligent enough and sensitive enough to sense the amount of hard work that we put in. If we don't put in hard work on any one day, they can figure it out. They will be polite enough not to show this, but they will understand this. And therefore, we have no choice but to put in that. So preparation and hard work is, I think, very fundamental. Ethics, a lot can be said about ethics. Perhaps the society expects ethics to be guarded more seriously by teaching community than by any other part of the human society, that I think is an incorrect expectation. I think all human beings should behave ethically. That's why we have the law, we have the customs, we have the conventions. But for teachers, we must remember some components of ethics very, very clearly which are important. There are many dimensions and all of you will be familiar with those, so I will not repeat those. But I will talk about just two things. Plagiarism. Plagiarism is not just copying and using somebody else's content. That is not plagiarism. It becomes plagiarism when we do that without giving the appropriate attribution to the people whose material we are using. We often fail to do that. You know, when we 
set a question paper repeating questions which were asked earlier. That is also plagiarism. Here we are not plagiarizing from somebody else's question paper. We are plagiarizing from our own question paper to save us time. The only reason for plagiarism is I want to save time and get credit. There is no other reason. If I spend enough time, I can always express any idea in my own ways. I will work hard for it. If I don't do it, I just want to save time. And this is a temptation. Believe me, we as human beings, and I spent a lot of time considering this, you know, when we used to argue, you know, why, why that fellow teaches badly? And Professor Kekre would tell me, please understand this. No teacher goes to a class with a desire to be a bad teacher. No teacher ever does that. Every teacher wants to be a good teacher. But every teacher works in a certain constraint. Constraint of time, constraint of his or her own motivation, and constraint of the circumstance. To overcome those constraints is what is required is to avoid plagiarism. If we Xerox, okay, pages of a textbook and circulate it ourselves, considering that these particular pages are important to the students, then can we shout at students if they Xerox the whole book? We often take recourse to the fact that some book is not available. If the book is not available, one copy should be purchased, kept in the library, and people should be told to come and read it. We extend this further when we enter into a research field. There are many cases where you, you have seen that, you have seen reports where even a vice chancellor of a university was involved in plagiarism. This nonsense must stop and is our responsibility. And let me tell you the most shameful part is in India, the plagiarism is considered to be far more prevalent than in other places. It is there everywhere, by the way. It is a human tendency to shortcut. I want to maximize my gains with minimum effort. That's a natural human optimization process. But if we don't stop it, who else will? Fiduciary ethics, money ethics, very, very important part in life. I mean, people stupidly expect teachers to be not money-minded. That is nonsense. Every human being must be money-minded. After all, uh, when I work, okay, I earn some wealth to support my family and I have expectations from life, so there is nothing wrong in it. But whether I generate that wealth legally and ethically or not is a question. What is legal? Well, there should be no under the table kind of movement of money that I should get. What is ethical? I should get money for what? I am destined to get money and nothing else. There is a new notion of tuition, coaching classes. Unfortunately, engineering colleges are afflicted maximally with this disease. Again, you may, you may fault me for quoting again and again from IIT system, but that is one system where there is no notion of a tuition. If a student on the campus wishes to ask me a difficulty at 10.30 or 11 o'clock in the night, the student has every right to come and knock at my door and ask me that difficulty. And he has every right to expect me to perform my duty to explain that problem to him or her. That is why I get paid for. There are operating hours for the staff, 8 to 5, 8.30 to 6 or something. There are no operating hours for teachers. A teacher is supposed to be on duty 24 hours. If I am supposed to leave this campus even on a Saturday or Sunday, I am supposed to inform people. I am of course required to engage in so many activities as a professional. I am permitted to do so. But my fundamental attention and focus must be on teaching, for which I am paid. Submission of grades in time. So much maramari in many universities in declaring results. We have this rule that grades must be submitted in four days. And then there was a big commotion in Senate when somebody said four days are being interpreted by some of the colleagues to exclude Saturdays and Sundays if they fall in between. That is nonsense. Four days means 96 hours. Current Senate rule says that the grades must be submitted in 96 hours. And if we don't submit those grades, then there is a special provision of a peculiar reception. I first get a letter from the dean. I am unfortunately, this is one, timeliness is one thing which I preach but not practice. Most of the other things I have, I have tried to practice my life. So you get invited by the director 
for a special meeting. That's the only time when the director does not offer you a cup of tea. I had one such occasion when late Professor Nath called me and I was teaching a large course as Mrs. Kripal said. For large courses we have seven days. But my grades were not submitted even after seven days because I had to go out somewhere. My teaching assistants were consolidating that. And I just delayed, got it delayed by some time but I got called by the director. And I went there and Professor Nath said, oh, Pata, you know, you will not get a cup of tea today, but of course I was permitted to sit down. But you can have a smoke. He used to smoke his charmina, he gave me a cigarette. So he says, why have the grace been delayed? So I said, sir, I have to go for this conference urgently and this. He said, yeah, I know you are doing, you know, so many great things elsewhere. You are helping the government, helping this. Very nice. Why don't you do one thing, Papa? Why don't you leave this job? and go and do all those nice things that you are doing. I was shocked to hear this. Then his voice became stern. He says, let us understand one thing. We must never ever forget that we are teachers first. We must never ever compromise with fundamental duties of teacher. If you cannot take that burden, leave this institute now. But if you want to stay here, this nonsense shall not happen again. Thank you very much. This is what my director told me and I know he used to love me immensely. I know he used to respect me immensely. But there is no nonsense to be tolerated when it comes to basics and fundamentals. Do we do that friends? Do we do that amongst ourselves? Do we do that as peer pressure on our colleagues? If a colleague is not doing things, do we take, go and tell that colleague, please you don't do this, this is not good. Why you don't do this, you know, we feel that the person may be offended. I am a good friend of his or her and then what will he or she think if I go and tell him or her that this is not correct. This is the biggest mistake that we make. Because if we as friends don't tell our colleagues that something is wrong, who else? Their enemies will come and tell them? Who else will tell them? If I am making a mistake, who is the best person to correct me? My own friend and colleague, nobody else. My enemies will rejoice quietly. I will only my friends will be concerned, they will come back and tell me something. Do we do this? I will only give one example which is perhaps an extreme but I think a very important. Uh, those of you who are from Pune would know about that person, a great Maharshi Karve who set up the women's education system in the country. It is said that he would not accept, because he was in public life, he would not accept any gift from anybody and that anybody included anybody. Once his son, bought him a blazer because the winter in Pune is very severe and he looked at that blazer and says very nice thank you but must be very costly isn't it so the son said yeah but it's okay his son was of course earning enough money he says but I am sorry I can't pay for it I can't afford it so he says what are you talking about Baba I am your son I am giving it to you he says no I cannot take a gift from anyone that includes you that sir is the ethics None of us can perhaps reach that level, but can we not try? Do we? That's the question. And that's the question each one of us has to continuously ask oneself. In conclusion, I will say the following. To motivate students, please help them recognize their own strengths, which they have forgotten over the years. Rekindle their childhood. You know, when I told this to my wife, she, she, she said, that child, now that is, that is why I think you behave so childishly. You know, it is a different context. So while these may be good, there may be several other dimensions of childhood which may perhaps better be removed after we grow up. So, but do resurrect this confidence in themselves. Self-confidence is most important. Getting rid of their sense of lack of confidence, sense of diffidence is very, very crucial. Like it or not, most of the students who come to us are diffident about something. Even if I got computer science in BJT, I did not get admission in computer science in IIT. Bombay will be a cause of difference. Because the world is relative, I will measure my relative successes and failures, and failures will be much more than successes because the pyramidal nature of the thing. So if you can motivate them to rethink about this and rediscover their own great potential for curiosity, boldness and perseverance. You are one half the better. The remaining half you will win by working hard 
for being a role model to this world. Because you are the role model. You like it or not, you are the role model. They will take us like this. You will know, I mean, 10 years, 15 years later when your students pass out and somebody comes back and tells you, sir, you taught that course well. How, how, how do you feel? Is there any money, any reward that can compensate you for that, that feeling? Absolutely not. That's the best compensation that we can get as teachers. It's fantastic feeling. So, work on this and, of course, the most fundamental, in order to motivate people, please remain motivated all the time yourselves. Thank you very much.